we read in the twelfth chapter of Revelation that the devil has come down in great wrath because he knows his time is short. And we're living in that time when we're witnessing a great demonic flood sweeping across the earth. It's seen in everything from rock and roll to the rise of the cults. I want to deal tonight with something that's very important in our spiritual education, and that is instruction in spiritual warfare against the powers of darkness. We deal with this subject on occasion, and the Lord has led to give some more instruction along this line. If you turn to Matthew chapter 12, I want to read a few verses there. Matthew chapter 12, where Jesus had an experience one day with the Pharisees concerning his deliverance of a demon-possessed person. Verse 22, then was brought into him one possessed with a demon, blind and dumb. And he healed him inasmuch as the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, is this not the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out demons, but by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. And Jesus knew their thoughts, word of knowledge. And he said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out demons, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. And also, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he shall spoil his house? He that's not with me is against me. Well, Jesus spent a good deal of his ministry delivering people from the bondage and power of the devil. It's significant that he spent a large part of his ministry doing this. In Acts 10.38, we're told God anointed Jesus of Nazareth to do this, to bind the power of the devil and to deliver the oppressed. So I say it's significant that Jesus spent a good time doing this, not just healing the sick, but delivering the oppressed. And Isaiah 61, verse 1 says he will do this, he will set the captives free. And then it's also significant that when Jesus sent the twelve forth, he commanded them to go preach, saying, the kingdom of God is at hand, heal the sick, raise the dead, and cast out demons. See, that was a part of the message of the kingdom. It's also significant that in Mark 16 and the commission he gave to the church, that he said these signs would follow believers. And one of the signs is, he said, in my name, you'll cast out demons. Now, demons, the reality of demons were quite evident in the ministry of Jesus and the early church. Because we go on to read how that one of the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12 is the discernings of spirits which is used generally in connection with casting out demons. Not always, but generally. Sometimes God reveals the presence and activity of spirits for other reasons. But generally, that's what that gift operates for. Now, he goes on to tell us, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 12, that not every Christian will have the gift of discerning of spirits. But Jesus said in Mark 16 that any believer could cast out a spirit. And so since... Not everyone will have the gift of discernment of spirits. Then much of our ministry has been directed to the average charismatic Christian to show him or her how to recognize the presence and activity of these evil spirits. It's amazing how many people say, I read your book, Angels of Light, and yet a demon could walk past them and they could never recognize one. If you would get into that book, for example, you'd see there are hundreds of abnormalities mentioned which show you how to recognize the presence and activity of demonic spirits working in others as well as, I won't say yourself, but depending on who's reading the book, it could be themselves. And I don't expect everyone to be able to memorize all of that or maybe to recognize all that. So we take a different approach. We try to show you 
Since you don't have, not everyone has the gift of discernings of spirits, we try to show you how to recognize in a major way or a general way their presence and activity. And not just call it some affliction or some abnormality or that person seems a little queer. I've often seen just pictures of people that I know need deliverance by looking at the eyes. There are ways to tell in the eyes when they need deliverance. We've had some wild ones here. I don't mean any of you, but some wild ones that they wouldn't have to tell you they're false apostles or whatever. You can look in their eyes. And there are other ways to tell. There was a wild one down here one night that I wouldn't want to meet him in a dark alley in the natural. (laughs) Well, if I saw him in any other context, I'd say demon possession needs deliverance, you see. If you know how to recognize these things. Now, we can't expect, as I say, for you to memorize everything in the book Angels of Light. There we primarily deal with occult oppression, but that form of oppression can result from anything else, so the characteristics would be generally the same. And so we do like somebody said the banks do. You know, the banks can't teach their tellers how to recognize every kind of counterfeit money because somebody's always devising a new $10 bill or whatever. They couldn't train them how to recognize all the various counterfeit coins and monies, so they take the opposite approach and teach them how to recognize the genuine money so that the counterfeit is recognized immediately. And so we can't teach a person everything about what it would be nice for them to know about the presence and activity of demonic spirits. So we take the opposite approach and we try to show you the major things that you need to know and then let the Spirit of God guide you. Now we see something here, for example, in Matthew 12 and verse 29. We're going to be dealing with some principles that we've not dealt with before concerning deliverance. Now we've got a lot of tapes on spiritual warfare and deliverance and so forth. We want to try to take a little different approach tonight and show you some other things that we see here in this passage. Here's a very important principle seen in Matthew 12 and verse 29 where Jesus said, How can one enter the strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man? Now, how many times have you read that? How many times have you read that passage and never realized he said something to you there? That the average person will rush into the presence of demons, and some of them are awfully strong demons, without binding them first. And then wonder why they don't go out. Well, listen to what he said. How can you enter the strong man's house? Now, he's talking about the possessed person. Not a literal house. How can you enter a strong man's house except you first bind the strong man? Who's the strong man? The devil. And then you can spoil his house. The strong man, verse 26, he said, If Satan cast out Satan, so he's talking about Satan as a strong man. In verse 28, if I cast out demons, so he's talking about the devil and demons. The house is the oppressed individual. Verses 43 to 45. 43 says, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man. And then in verse 44, then the unclean spirit says, I will return to my house from whence I came out. So the house is the man. Are you following so far? When the unclean spirit goes out of a man and Jesus, by analogy, talks about a strong man who has a house. But he's talking about the possessed or oppressed individual. That you cannot cast out strong spirits, at least. Now, some demons will go if they catch sight of you. (laughs) A spirit-filled Christian. But we're not dealing with those little imps. We're talking about some that we have met on occasion, and you will meet. And you've met them sometimes and maybe didn't recognize them. You just thought it was a person acting that way. But anyway, He's talking about binding the devil, the strong man, before you try to cast him out. Verse 29, he said, bind the devil and loose the oppressed. Not loose the oppressed and bind the devil. Now, especially would you do this when you're dealing with extremely strong spirits, and some are quite strong. Like in Mark 5... Jesus commanded that spirit to go out, and it didn't go out. Then he said, what's your name? There's a procedure, you see. 
He had to get his name, and then he named his name and cast that spirit out of the name. Now, that's a little secret that we've already covered, I know, or you've heard from other sources. That when you read those passages on healing or deliverance or whatever, watch what he says or what he did. And remember, it isn't always recorded in the order that we would do it in the West here. We've said this many times, too. The Hebrew mind or the Oriental mind doesn't think logically like we do. We have minds like calculators. And if you set down something that you did or that happened, it's one, two, three, four, just like it happened. But you may get the finale at the beginning in an account in Scripture. That's just the way it is with the Hebrew mind. Often that way. So you read the account in Mark chapter 5. And you will see there that he had commanded the spirit to come out. It did not go. Then he asked it its name. But that's in reverse order as you read the account. But anyway, especially when you're dealing with strong spirits, do you want to bind them first before you cast them out? That's a good procedure. But it would be good to follow that procedure whenever you're dealing with any kind of a spirit, even though they're not strong spirits, that is, relatively speaking. Now... I don't hesitate to say that I don't believe in marathon deliverance. This all night are getting spirits out in a brown paper bag and that sort of thing. If you don't know what we're talking about, you're just that much better off. Some people don't believe you can get a person delivered unless they vomit in a brown paper bag. And there are meetings where they pass out bags. Literally, that goes on. And I haven't found that one in Scripture yet. And anyway, Jesus cast out spirits with a word. If you got the faith, you don't need bags. Or if you got Bibles, you don't need bags. But sometimes spirits, strong spirits, will manifest themselves. Now, that's a different question, and it may take five or ten minutes. (laughs) Still, that is a marathon, you see. I'm not setting any rules on time. That is what I'm saying, because you may have to deal with a person sometime for 30 minutes. They may have a legion in them like legion did. That is to get them all out by name. That's possible. But the longest I've ever dealt with anybody was about 10, 15 minutes. That's the longest. And sometimes it had a lot of spirits to come out. What I started out to say was some spirits don't manifest. And you cast them out by faith. And they have to go whether or not they manifest. They're not that type of spirit. If you're alert to how they go out, I've heard people just sigh like that when I've commanded. And the spirit went out. Or they'll begin to weep a little. Or they began to laugh because the deliverance came. Or sneeze. Or even belch. Or wretch. And I didn't see a demon. It's just the spirit going out. But sometimes it's almost imperceptible. And sometimes it happens later on the way home. One woman said, after you prayed for me, I had stopped the car. I don't know how many times on the way home. They just kept coming out and they came out by retching. She just stopped along the highway and got rid of demons. Well, (laughs) to the non-charismatic mind, that isn't even sanitary, let alone appetizing to talk about it. That would never happen in their church in a thousand years. Sometimes when people come for prayer, I've been led to go grab the newspapers before we pray for them, lay them on the floor. And we've needed them. I didn't always do that. (laughs) One spirit that came out was the spirit of Baptist doctrine one time. And uh, I'm glad I had something there when it came out. Spirit of Baptist doctrine. Can you believe that? (laughs) Somebody said, what if it had been Methodist doctrine? Would you have told it? Or Presbyterian? Well, Baptist is my background, and that's what I heard. I'd be telling on myself if I was trying to hide the fact. Now, that doesn't mean Baptists don't have some truth or Methodists or Lutherans or Presbyterians. Remember, we're not anti-people. We're just anti-denominational system that man invented and substitutes for the New Testament church. But that's another story. So some spirits are not especially strong, and you won't even know if they go except by faith. But when they're strong ones, you better bind them first. Personally, I am led of the Lord. That is to say... I do whatever the Spirit seems to indicate I should do at the time. And if they need to be bound, they get bound. Strong spirits should be bound. I've had spirits threaten. The best thing to do is bind them if they do. Before you try to cast them out. If they threaten you, and they will. And some big old demons are in big old people. (laughs) So if they threaten you, bind them first. 
And I've had people, that is, demons in people, interrupt meetings and try to stop the meeting. And if you're aware of what the purpose is, you don't fall into that snare and get in an argument with somebody out there. You notice that night when the false apostles tried to prophesy here against us, that I said, let's sing power in the blood. And I'm saying this to you now. If I'm not here, if we are, when those, well, let's say it another way, hypothetically, we believe they won't be back. Hypothetically, if a case like that ever happened, whoever's closest to it and hears that Amen. false spirit speaking begin to sing a song on the blood. And you see, the quickest way to defeat the devil is not to give him an audience. That's your ear. Don't listen to it. That's why I dismissed the service, said, let's go, let's go out singing. Some of you didn't know what was happening, but we were defeating the devil at his own game. You see, he can only influence people if he can be heard. Let's don't give him a platform. That's all I'm saying. So I've had spirits jump up in meetings as we travel about the country. Occasionally, not very often, thank the Lord. But occasionally, and I know what their method or tactic or purpose is, and that is to stop the meeting, to get me to deal with that right then. Like up in Pittsburgh once or near there, I was about 10 minutes in my message on the deeper life. And you know, the deeper life is harder to receive than the faith message. You think divine healing is rough. The message of divine healing, you know, where it's all God, no doctors, no blue cross, just the old rugged cross. That really disturbs a lot of charismatics who like to have their cake and eat it too. You know, God will heal me while I have surgery or heal me on the medicine. That's pretty strong meat, but deeper life's much stronger. I was about 10 minutes in the message when this spirit shouted through this woman, Shut up! Shut up! Stop it! Stop it! Shut up! Big meeting. Well, you see... That would have probably wrecked a lot of messages if you were following notes. Shake a person up, you know, to, but when you're led to the Spirit, you can let him lead you there too. So this demon was saying, shut up, shut up. I said, devil, you shut up. I didn't even look at it. I said, I bind your power in Jesus' name. I command you to be quiet. I know what you're doing. You're trying to interrupt this service and it isn't going to happen. I just went right on preaching. Like nothing had happened. Well, that demon was quiet. Through the meeting, after the meeting, that demon-possessed individual came and got delivered. Of course, I had no way of knowing that would happen. Praise God, it had a good ending. People had brought her there for help. And I don't know what would have happened if I'd been preaching on the subject that we're teaching tonight. I was just teaching on the deeper life. But the message of the cross, that demon couldn't stand it. And so what I'm saying is that a lot of people would try to deal with that spirit. Well, let's get that woman delivered. And you'd have been the whole service trying to deliver that demon-possessed individual. And it may not have happened. And even if it would have happened, why, there are a lot of people there that, like, may be some here tonight that don't yet know what we're talking about. Bless your hearts. We don't mean that in criticism. But if we'd have dealt with that demon right there in the middle of the service, we'd have probably lost some of them. Well, we've had some hair-raising experiences. So that's just one of where the meeting has been interrupted. Another time when total possession of a woman and she began to writhe and hiss like an old serpent. Now, that was our first experience, and she did tear the service up as well as one of the chairs. (laughs) We'd only had the baptism a few weeks, and we didn't know what to do except go against the Spirit, and the whole church was tied up for the whole service delivering that woman. She didn't get delivered, but we got the devil quiet long enough we could all go home. (laughs) And I said, never again. I said, that isn't the way you do it. That isn't the way you do it. But, you know, how do you learn except through experiences and the Word of God? And if we'd have just bound that power, and epileptic spirits will seize people sometimes when you come on with a strong message of faith. I don't know how many times that's happened. Oh, those spirits just, they can't get out because they're in the person. They want to get out of that meeting. And so the only way they can get out is start writhing and gyrating and whatever they can do. And so rather than let it tear up a service, why just deal with it in faith and go right on? I mean, what can you do anyway? with spirits manifesting except tear your service up. 
Now, when epilepsy has manifested itself, we have dealt with it because it can be dealt with by just commanding a spirit to leave, you see. It's not like those powerful spirits that where the person has control of themselves, so to speak, and are opposing you as a person, but you know it's a demon. But where the person's out in a coma, we have, on two occasions, I know, cast the spirit out, and they recovered just like that. In one case, he came right behind me and got saved and baptized in the spirit in one of our meetings. What I'm saying is, bind the power of the strong man so he can't tear up your service. If there's strong spirits, you should follow what he says here. How can you enter the strong man's house except you bind him first, and then you can enter into his house, that is, you can enter into the place that he's possessed by your word of faith and clean the house out. Now, here's another thing you see in Jesus' ministry that's very instructive and I feel helpful. Verses 43 to 45. Now, the important thing we're going to see here, the important principle in Jesus' ministry of deliverance concerns the need of binding those powerful spirits. Like the leaders are the doorkeepers. They actually call themselves doorkeepers, the powerful ones. Binding them to the regions to where they should be bound in the present time. We'll see this in verses 43 to 45. We see here in this passage another important principle in Jesus' ministry of deliverance. And that is we should bind those strong spirits, leaders, lieutenants, doorkeepers, who let the others in and out, to those regions that we can bind them to in this present time. That is, send them to a place. And where is that place? We'll see in a moment. Because to leave those powerful spirits too near the house they've just vacated and not bind them to some region, leaves them too near the premises to invade it again, if that person doesn't get their life filled up with the word and faith as soon as they should, then that spirit will enter back in and bring others with it. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, now he's talking about he goes out, where does he go? He walks through dry places. Now there's something else. That you learned tonight. You've read it. Jesus didn't say they go to the pit. Where some people try to cast them. He says when the demon has gone out of a man. He walks about in dry places. Seeking rest. He isn't bound. He isn't bound in the pit where he can't come up. But he finds none. Then the spirit says. I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he has come. He finds it empty. Swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. That means he's the doorkeeper, you see. And they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Now, the doorkeeper is the one who lets the other spirits in and out. In every case of possession, and we're not getting into the semantics tonight of whether we're talking about oppression, obsession, possession, or whatever. We're talking about what Jesus is talking about. He said the body is a house and it can be invaded and infested with demons. So we're talking about that. Some people try to make subtle little distinctions about whether it's oppression or possession sometimes. I just say, what difference does it make? If he's sitting on your shoulder and got your head bound with migraines with a spiritual steel band around your head, what does it matter where you cast him off your shoulder or out of your stomach or whatever? I mean, you're just dealing with a lot of theological nonsense. I suppose I've done about as much study in theology and the Bible as anybody, at least most people, and I still, if I deal with sickness or whatever, I deal with the devil. He's tried to put an infected toe on me that he can't. And I talk to the devil. I say, devil... I refuse this. I was healed at Calvary. You see, you can argue about, oh, that's an infection. That's medical, physical, whatever. It's the devil. That's why I get healed and some people don't. It's because I always deal with the devil. If it's adverse, the devil causes it. It doesn't matter where the wreck out here was... Because of negligence or whatever, the devil's behind it. All adversity. Lightning and tornadoes and floods are not acts of God in spite of the insurance policies. 
its nature gone wild under the control of evil spirits. Jesus rebuked the wind at sea. He didn't say, what a mighty display of the power of God. (laughs) This is an act of God. Well, he would have been rebuking God. He rebuked that wind. And wind doesn't hear. W-I-N-D can't hear a word. That's a spirit he was talking to. Like you rebuke a fever. F-E-V-E-R can't hear. But... What we call fever is a spirit. Jesus rebuked the fever and Peter's mother-in-law was healed. Well, all of that, you see, is a part of understanding how to deal with these spirits. And so here's a doorkeeper that lets others in and out. And he said, when that spirit goes out, he goes into the dry places. Well, in dealing with powerful spirits, that's what you should do. Cast them into the dry places. Bind them to the dry places, that is. You cast them into the pit. Some people say, well, you ought to cast them into the pit. And that's what they say they do. But that's getting a little premature because over in Revelation chapter 20 and verses 1 and 2, we read that, The angel came down with a chain in his hand and he bound the devil, that dragon, in the bottomless pit. And that was at the beginning of the millennium, bound him for a thousand years. Now, let me just give you one experience that we had with a particularly strong spirit who was the doorkeeper and who let others in and out and to show you some of the methods we used. And by the way, the methods we use are whatever the spirit leads at the time, although that doesn't mean you shouldn't have a procedure in mind, but we were in a southwestern city speaking and had prayed for the sick and so on, and a young man, 18 years old, came after the rest of them right at the last and said he'd been involved in the occult, and I think he had read our tract on this or whatever, wanted deliverance. And I took him through the usual procedure of instruction, and the two steps had him renounce occult participation and put it under the blood in Jesus' name, and then had him rebuke the powers of darkness because I said, you open the door and only you can close it initially. Then I laid my hand on his head and I said, I deliver you from the powers of darkness as a result of our cult participation in Jesus' name. At least that's what I was going to say. <laughs> I'd no sooner touched his head and the spirits took total possession and began to manifest. He fell down on the floor and began to writhe and scream, and I began to command, come out. And they were saying, no, no. Well, when they do that, then you ask them to name themselves. They won't come out if they're strong. If there's a strong doorkeeper, he won't let the others out, even though they want out. They can't get past him. And so, no, no. Well, I said, as Jesus did, what's your name? Mark 5, that's the way he did it. And they have to give their name because when you're ministering faith, and so the first one said, I am the spirit of pride and I refuse to go. Well, I said, out you go in Jesus' name and with much screaming and writhing, out he went. Now, this fellow was on the floor while all this was going out. I was down on my knees beside him commanding, you see. Another one began to manifest, and I said, what's your name? And he said his name was, I'm the demon of disfigurement. I've disfigured this boy, and I don't know how. He must have had some disfigurement on his body. Out he went with much screaming and hissing. And the next one said, I am the demon of fear. I rule this world. I have power over everyone. Fear rules this world. I make people afraid of everything. I rule the world. And he does. He was telling the truth. Demons don't always lie. Fear rules this world. Oh, you can learn a lot in deliverance. I don't recommend that you learn it that way, but you can learn a lot. You'd need a library if God put in there everything we need to know about healing and deliverance and faith and so on. But he said, I rule this world, and he does. He rules in the church. He's got Christians, charismatics, afraid to trust God When God sent Jesus to Calvary to purchase their healing, the first little symptom or ache or pain, they run to the doctor. And we're not getting at the fact that it isn't always easy because sometimes there are trials that are more difficult than others. But God is that much greater. I mean, is it any harder for God to heal a headache than a cancer? I mean, is it any harder for God? It is for doctors, but not for God. So fear rules this world. He has people afraid of accident, failure, financial loss. Has them afraid of everything imaginable. And so 
he went out saying, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. And then we got to the doorkeeper. They were slipping by him. And the doorkeeper said, I'm the doorkeeper. Now there's a doorkeeper every time. Every time there is strong possession, there's a doorkeeper. And like in Mark 5, his name was Legion. We are many. But see, Legion was doing the talking. And he said, I'm the doorkeeper. and You don't dare cast me out. He said, if you do, there's spirits still in there of ESP and occultism. And all sorts of things he named that are still in him. Drug addiction. And he said, if you cast me out, they can't get out. And he'll be possessed by these things forever. Well, I knew that was the devil's lie. How many of you would have fallen for that? Well, don't raise your hand, of course. <laughs> I knew that was the devil's lie. He said, you better not cast me out. And so he was the strong one. And, of course, we commanded and out he went with much agonizing, screaming and... A nice looking young man until that happened. You never recognize him after it's over or while it's happening. And out he went and of course the others followed. Because when the doorkeepers go, there's nothing to keep them in there. Now, what we're saying is that when the doorkeeper was saying he wouldn't go, and then he said, if, you see right away he knew he had to, he said, if I go, these other spirits will stay in him. I said, I cast you out in Jesus' name. Well, he said, I'm not going. I said, out you go in Jesus' name. Well, he said, where will I go? I said, I bind you to the dry places in Jesus' name. And then he was so strong, he began to call on the devil. He said, Satan, Satan, come and help me. Jesus is too strong. He's too powerful. I can't stand against him. See, it wasn't Hobart. It was Jesus. It was that word of faith. Oh, he said, come and help me. I said, out you go in Jesus' name. I talked to them about like that. Out you go in Jesus' name. One said, I'm not coming out. I said, out you go. Because I'm not doing anything but believing. I've got the anointing of the Holy Ghost in faith. And I still say, I don't believe in marathon deliverance. But of course, there was about 15 minutes with him. And that's about as long as you need to deal with a person. As far as I know, if you run into a case where it'd take you an hour, that still isn't all night like some practice. And I don't even criticize them. I just say, I don't believe in it. I don't find it in the Word. But anyway, he was set free and we bound the doorkeeper to the dry places and the others with him. Now, as I said, there's some who believe you should cast them in the pit, but I believe that's for later. The demons know, the demons know there's a time when God's going to deal with them finally and permanently. And they know that you can't cast them into regions where it's not authorized for you to do so. Ahead of time. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 29, we read how one of the demons recognized Jesus. And notice what he said. They cried, saying, What have we to do, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before our time? Now that's significant. They know they've got a time for torment to be cast into the pit. And we do have authority on the word of Jesus, back to Matthew 12, 43, 45, where when spirits go out, they do go into dry places. So you could bind them to those places. I dare say that doorkeeper will never get back in anybody because he's bound into the dry places. But you can't bind them to the pit. If Jesus could have done that, why didn't he do it? He could have rid the world of demons. It's interesting he never cast a demon to the pit. And yet I hear ministers do that. Now there's only one exception, and if there's an exception, that's between the minister and God. He says by revelation, he for his ministry, he isn't telling us to do it, he ministers only in the Spirit, goes into tremendous travail for churches and things. And then in the Spirit, he and this brother that have this ministry, they go in the Spirit. Now, this is an astral projection, because you can be caught up in the Spirit. He says, we go in the Spirit into those regions and battle the demons of hell. He said, hospital corridors are just swarming with black hordes of demons. You want to get possessed or a demon of death or infirmity, just visit one. That is without the protection of the blood and the shield of faith. 
Now he says the Lord has said to him to cast him into the pit. He may have that authority. Who am I to say he doesn't? But we have to stay with the word for our own ministry. All of that's interesting and educational. And he has a very unique ministry. It's rather involved to even explain it. But it's a ministry of spiritual warfare. He goes into churches and would you believe it's like hospitals. Demons just in control. This denominational system. And God has a purpose in maybe setting a church free long enough for him to get a few saved or whatever. So they go in and do battle in the spirit. In the spiritual realm, things can take place. Like one brother said to me, a friend of mine said, I was talking to an Anglican priest up in Canada. He said, I was witnessing him about charismatic truth. As I was sitting there talking to him, I saw my spirit go out, you know, in a vision. Except not in a vision, but in the spirit. I saw my spirit go out. His spirit came out of him. And we battled. We wrestled. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, Paul says, Ephesians 6. And we wrestled and I overcame him. And he was sitting there resisting everything I said. But he said, when I saw my spirit overcome his spirit, then his whole expression changed. And he sat there and listened. He was a homosexual and a liberal and didn't believe anything. Just had the garb on, you know. Please stop your machine at this point and turn the tape over. And he was sitting there resisting everything I said. But he said, when I saw my spirit overcome his spirit, then his whole expression changed. And he sat there and listened. He was a homosexual and a liberal and didn't believe anything. Just had the garb on, you know. And so things can take place in the spiritual dimension, you see, that you may not even know is going on. Sometimes I may be up here battling spirits that no one knows. I'm not going to give the devil the advantage of letting him tear up a meeting. And there are ways to battle spirits as you minister to people without disturbing or stopping the meeting. On occasion, we've had to stop a meeting and just bind the spirits. I did that once in Birmingham, Alabama. I said, would you believe there's a Baptist spirit of unbelief in here resisting everything I'm saying? I generally don't say things like that in a meeting where you're going to be there two or three days. But I got a letter later and a Baptist pastor said, I had just walked in and sat down when you said that. And I had come saying, I'm not going to believe a thing he says. You wonder why they come? Well, that's a whole book in itself, isn't it? He said, I'm not going to believe a thing he says. But as soon as I sat down, he said that. A Baptist spirit of unbelief is rejecting everything I'm saying. That really got to him. He took the faith book, got convinced, got the baptism. And, well, praise God, that's a story with a good ending, too. But it isn't always that way. So you can battle in the spirit. But back to the binding. You see that you can bind them to regions where Jesus didn't because it would have been nice for him to rid the world of demons and we wouldn't have to deal with them. Now that brings us to another thing in verse 28. Here's another important principle we see in his ministry of deliverance. He said, I cast out spirits, demons, by the Spirit of God. I cast out demons by the Spirit of God. In Mark 5, we referred to the Gadarene demoniac who had the legion. What did Jesus do there? He cast them into the swine, still not the pit. He said, when spirits go out, they go into dry places. Now, he didn't always cast them into swine. In fact, that's the only time I'm sure he did it. He allowed them to go in the swine. That's the same as telling them, you know, where to go. Then he goes on to say, I cast out spirits, demons, by the Spirit of God. Now, that means to me, we should be led by the Spirit of God in dealing with demons. This is not a time to work in the flesh. This is not a time to get intellectual or to shout or to threaten. I'm not too loud anyway, and I don't get loud with demons. This doesn't mean we should not have a procedure, a consistent procedure to follow when we're dealing with people who are oppressed and need help. But 
As I counsel and minister to people who need help or deliverance, I follow a general procedure. Like, if they need deliverance, I minister by faith. But I don't have any set procedure to the extent that if the Spirit says to do something a certain way, that I don't hear the Spirit to do that. I generally try to follow what the Spirit shows. You should have enough consistency about you that if you're going to pray for a hundred people, you don't want to try to do it a hundred different ways. That isn't what we're saying. But you should be so sensitive to the voice of the Spirit as Jesus was. He said, I cast out demons by the Spirit of God. That's quite interesting to me. If strong demons manifest, that's the time for you to look to the Spirit. Not to look to your past experiences, our education, our study of my book, Angels of Light, or whatever. That's the time to look to the Spirit. All those other things are helpful in their place. And so I want the Spirit to guide me. For example, when I was dealing with a man, uh, again, as soon as I touched his head, the demons took complete control and he went into a trance. He happened to be sitting in a chair. And the demons threatened, and so when they threaten, you bind when he saw he couldn't frighten me because I said, you don't frighten me, I'm under the protection of the blood of Jesus. I hate the blood, the demons say, but you just go right on pleading the blood. And then so he tried to bribe me, I'll give you the revelations I'm giving him if you won't cast us away, you know. In other words, inviting them into me, I said, no, thank you, I get my revelations from Jesus. And I commanded it to name itself. The doorkeeper was the feminine spirit, Jezebel. A spirit of false religion. Jezebel symbolizes false religion, apostasy, apostate religion in the Old Testament. And I have no question in my own mind but what this was the spirit that was in Jezebel. Because, you see, demons never die. I was questioning this spirit, and the spirit said, I entered this man, and it was talking in a feminine voice, by the way. This was a big, strong fellow, you know, that, in fact, he was the most possessed person I've ever seen. When I saw him, he just said, I've got to have help. He just shook and trembled the whole time. He said, demons are in me and all of that, and I want to believe this message of deliverance and all. And he was really needing help badly. And as soon as I touched his head, then this feminine spirit and all the grimacing and facial expressions and everything else was feminine. And a feminine voice. So I was questioning, and I said, when did you enter this man? I entered him at a spiritualist meeting. He just went out of curiosity. That's why we tell you, don't get in the devil's territory. Don't ever. If God sends you and he won't, then that's soon enough to go. If you want to know what they do in a house of prostitution or a nightclub or a pool room, at worst, read about it. You don't have to go and get first-hand information to be an authority. I wrote a book, Angels of Light, that's printed in the tens of thousands of copies, and I guess goes over a good part of the world. And I never attended a seance or played with a Ouija board. I feel like, and I'm pretty much an authority on some of these things. I do a lot of reading and study, still do. But... The Spirit was giving a lot of information, you know, and I had a lot of questions. Now, you can learn a lot questioning these doorkeepers and powerful spirits. But you see, if you're not led of the Spirit of God, you open yourself to danger. You have to be very careful. And I was under the anointing, and I had a lot of questions yet to ask. And I was getting information, and I just ready to ask another one when the Spirit of God, the anointing, fell on me. And I was compelled to cast that Spirit out. You see, the Spirit of God said, that's enough. Now, God will let you learn what He wants you to know, and then that's enough. I could have resisted that, then I would have been in trouble. But I mean, friends, it was like I had no choice, really. It was either get out of the room or command the Spirit to come out. And my question was phrased to ask Him something, and I said, in the name of Jesus, come out. And immediately, that Spirit began to wail like a woman and... Weave back and forth, and out it came. And then he was set free, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He was a Christian who got off, who had studied for the ministry. And he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, spoke fluent Hebrew, which I recognize since I teach it. And a complete transformation. I've never seen a more demon-possessed person, but as he sat in the meeting that night, he was like an angel. You know, his face just radiated. You could see it especially in the eyes. The whole features had changed. Because demons do actually change the features and affect everything about the person. Mentally, physically, spiritually. Now what I'm saying is that use the method that the Spirit directs you to use. 
follow the anointing. Jesus said, I cast out spirits, demons by the Spirit of God, and we should do likewise. Mere head knowledge or mere experience that you've gained by delivering people or praying for their deliverance is not enough. Make sure you're ministering by the Spirit and in faith. Now, does this mean that any Christian could cast out spirits? Well, some people say that was only for the apostles. Well, that's what the apostles thought at first. That's interesting. Mark chapter 9. Look at Mark chapter 9, verses 38 and 39. The institutional church often tells us, oh, that was only for the apostles. Well, that's what they thought at first. Mark chapter 9. Verses 38 and 39. And John answering him said, Master, we saw one casting out demons in thy name, and he followeth not us. That is the twelve. And we forbade him because he followeth not us. But Jesus said, Forbid him not. Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that shall speak lightly of me, for he that's not against us is on our part. So can any Christian cast out spirits? Well, Philip was not an apostle. He was a deacon turned evangelist, and Acts 8 says he cast out demons. Can any Christian cast out spirits? Well, think about it. I'm asking a question. I didn't mean you had to answer me, but answer yourself. No. (laughs) Not any Christian. And I'll tell you who I'm talking about. And that's a non-charismatic Christian. They don't have the power. They'll end up like the seven sons of Siva in Acts 19. If they try to use the name of Jesus. No, the church today can't cast out demons. It doesn't have the power. It can't bind the devil because the devil has it bound. Bound with unbelief and fear and sickness and premature death. And fear and resistance to the Holy Spirit. They don't have the power because they reject the one who has the power, the Holy Spirit. We don't cast out demons. Jesus didn't and he was son of God. He said, I cast out demons by the Spirit of God. How about that? You learned something else you said. No, he didn't cast out demons before he was baptized in the Spirit. Name one. Name one account. Give me one instance. Now, I'm not saying there are not cases you can read about where in desperation on a mission field, I've read them too, where they took the scriptures and in a marathon deliverance, read scriptures on deliverance and sang songs on the blood and so forth. And occasionally you can read about where a person got delivered. At least it appeared they did. Some of the spirits at least went out. There's no way for them to know they all went out because without the baptism, how would you know? You wouldn't even know how to recognize whether they'd all gone out or not. We're not talking about exceptions in our teaching here. We know you can find exceptions almost anything you say. We say that all the promises of God are received by faith. You've got to ask. Everyone who asketh receiveth. And I tell people, if you're not going to ask for healing or ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you'll never receive. You know, people sometimes, they've said this to me. Well, I've prayed, Lord, you know my heart. I want all you've got. If the baptism's for today and I don't believe it, then I want you to fill me with the Spirit and cause me to speak in tongues. And then I'll know it's valid. And Well, I tell people, you'll never get anything from God praying that way. But occasionally, I've read where a person stood up to oppose the baptism had a message, you know, to show it's not for today and start speaking in tongues. So God can do what he wants. One man said to me, he woke up in the middle of the night, never heard of the baptism, speaking in tongues. Another woman said the same thing, spoke in tongues, had to go around asking what was happening and finally ended up in a charismatic full gospel businessman's meeting and heard others doing what she was doing and found out she had been baptized. God didn't ask either one of their opinions. <laughs> The Presbyterian Church in Indonesia. God poured his spirit out there. Didn't ask if they wanted it. He just did it. Of course they want it after they get it. I'm not saying that. But. The usual procedure, though, is one way. And so it is with casting out spirits or whatever. You can find people who've never heard of the baptism of the Holy Spirit who could cite cases of deliverance. We know that. But that's the exception. 
Jesus casts them out by the Spirit of God. Be led of the Spirit. Can any believer? No, not any. Not by any means. Those are such exceptions. You could write a book about the exceptions where they don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There was more power over the devil in Peter's shadow than in the church today. <laughs> Just walked by and they were healed. The church today doesn't even believe in healing. There was more power in handkerchiefs taken from Paul's body over the sick and demon-possessed than in the whole denominational system. Just a rag. Acts 19, they just touched his body and then demons would go out when they'd touch people with it. They'd be healed of their diseases and infirmities. There isn't a church in the country outside charismatic circles that would ever see that ever happen. never happened in our church for 14 years and we were Baptists who believed all the Bible. I trust they can see me smiling downstairs because I'm smiling at myself. Yes, Baptists, we believed all the Bible. but well, we didn't believe half of the Bible. We never saw any of these things happen. And we've seen more than any one week happen through this body than all the 14 years before we became charismatic. Yes, there was more power in Peter's shadow than the church today. More power over the devil. But a spirit-filled Christian, yes, any one of you here, five years old and up, even younger, it's possible. Five-year-olds have cast out demons. Any spirit-filled Christian. Now, if that raises a problem, how could a five-year-old be filled with the Spirit? Well, hold on, we know of one case, two and a half. Spoke a few words in English fluently in tongues. Suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not. If your old Baptist, Lutheran, Methodist, Presbyterian, whatever kind of doctrine can't handle that, you'd better just leave it alone because God's doing it. He'll save them two years old if you'll get their attention on him. Two and a half. Yes, he'll baptize them in the Spirit. Well, he does it all the time. Three years old, four and five. I know of one family, he had... A four-year-old, I believe, and a five-year-old filled with the Spirit. And then he thought it was really something. He was telling me three years old. And then he said, here's the latest record, two and a half. Speaks very little in English, but speaks fluently in their tongues. Uh, Point them to Jesus. If they're old enough to believe in Daddy and Mama, they're old enough to believe in Jesus. If you can get a one-year-old to believe in Santa Claus, you can get them to believe in Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, the battle of the ages is on. There's a warfare going on for our possession, control of our minds and bodies and souls and spirits. We better be equipped is what we're saying. We better be equipped with the spiritual armor, sword of the spirit, the word of God, shield of faith, which comes from believing the word of God. But there's a great warfare going on already in the heavenlies. We read that Satan has come down in great wrath because he knows his time is short. There's a great demonic flood sweeping the earth. The cults are on the increase. And the powers of darkness are making inroads into homes, churches, schools, churches, businesses, churches, lives, (laughs) churches. Yes, you heard me right. Churches. We are... Hearing things come out of churches and charismatic circles that are totally diametrically opposed to the Word of God. Like Jesus dying spiritually is a good one to start and stop with. I don't know which. Became a sinner, had to be born again, and justified under the control and domination of Satan for three days. My Bible says when he died, he said, it's finished. Into thy hands, Father, I commend my spirit. Hallelujah. When he went into hell, he went into Hades to preach to the spirits in prison. He wasn't bound by the devil for three days. He didn't become a sinner or you've got the problem who died for Jesus. Because a sinner cannot purchase redemption for another sinner. But... Peter said we weren't purchased with corruptible things, but with the pure, spotless blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. 
Well, we've got a tape on that too. Did Jesus die spiritually? All the scripture that you need is there for that. But we're hearing things coming out of the mouths of people that we've had confidence in previously. And pray God, pray God that He will keep you from deception and error as well as sin. Because the hour is short and the trumpet must not give an uncertain sound. We've got to be very careful what we read, who we listen to, and give time to study and prayer. Because the devil goes about, Peter says, as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. This is a resistance, and you get that resistance out of the Word of God, and faith comes by hearing the Word of God. God is in the process of preparing an army, but that army will be of no value if it's overcome before it ever comes to maturity. So guard yourself from all of the icks and ticks and the heresies and men's ideas and programs and shepherdship teaching and covering any covering besides the blood of Jesus is out of the pit and not from God. The only covering in the Bible is the blood of Jesus Christ. Never submit yourself to some man as your covering. That is false. It is unscriptural. And it will bind you to the spirit that's working through that person. That spirit of submission to Satan himself. I tell people to go through I call deliverance if they've ever been in shepherdship heresy or error. Amen. And they had a big conference out there just recently now. Where was it? Kansas City. Thousands attending. And who were the leaders and featured speakers? The shepherdship leaders. You see, I told you it would happen that they'll get very quiet. See, the devil's strategy is, is not to push this thing. I said after those four tapes we make, and they went nationwide, and that advertising in Lagos Magazine opened a lot of eyes. I said, you watch, they're going to go quiet. That's the strategy of the devil. And then all of this opposition will blow over and you'll just see this cancer begin to grow and feed off of the church. And now they're even using some of the terminology that we used in those tapes. Like we said, you're witnessing the rise of a new charismatic denomination. So they're taking pains to stand in public and say this is not a new denomination that's starting. No, it isn't a new one starting. It's already started. It has already happened. And those men are not repenting or changing. Those men are just kind of playing it kind of cool, lying low, low key, the soft sell right now. But don't be deceived. It hasn't died. It's still out there. And it's deluding multitudes of people. Again, we have tapes on that. We can't say it all in one message. The shepherdship covering submitted body error. If you haven't heard them, you ought to hear them. Because Satan, he knows his time short. He's already got the world. He's got that institutional system so bound that they can't get loose unless we set them free. That is charismatics. And so he's working his hardest on charismatics. Now, this isn't Hobart talking. I hope you're not getting restless. I finished the sermon a long time ago. The Lord is giving you an admonishment that some of you are taking this rather coolly, like, well, it was interesting, the instructions on demons and his experiences and all, but we're saying that because Satan is going to try to reach your home, your business, your life, your body, your mind. If he can reach a few in this church, you have to be very careful. If he can reach a few in this church. Now, we say this in all humility, not in pride, but God has got a hub of a wheel here. And this ministry and message goes out everywhere, and this is only the beginning. Eventually, he's going to send people from here into areas that, well, some of you wouldn't believe. What am I doing here in Hong Kong? I wouldn't have believed it three years ago. How did it get here? Must have gotten transported. I was... Eating that chicken drumstick five minutes ago. What am I here for, Lord? Preach to those masses there. I've had them gathered in this building for three hours waiting on them. Wild way out? No, it's already happened to some extent. God is getting a people ready, but the devil isn't sitting back watching God work. This isn't a basketball game where God and the devil are spectators. They are warring. 
And the prize is you. Your soul. Oh, don't say like one said, I'll be the last to stumble or fall. He was the first. When we started this work and went on a lake in 1963, I'll be the last to go. I'll be the last to fail. I'll be the last to fall away. He was the first. 1 Corinthians 10 tells you to take heed lest you fall. Praise God you've got the faith you won't fall. But proud boasting and ignoring the fact that a roaring lion is seeking to devour you, the Christian Peter said. He's going about to devour you, whom resist steadfast in the faith. He wasn't writing to the world out there. He's already devoured them and digested them. He's talking to us. In the latter days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of demons. They're doing it right in charismatic circles. Breaks your heart sometimes to see some that are being led astray by these seducing spirits that have seduction and deception written all over them and they can't recognize it because they're not paying the cost in the word and in prayer and not keeping themselves. As James says, submit yourself to God, then resist the devil. You get that turned around, it won't work. Submit yourself to God every day, then you can resist the devil. You won't get in those situations where the devil perverts the truth and seduces you or gets you out into some physical, fleshly sin or whatever. This is the body he's working against. Who have you ever heard has had as much free advertising as we get? In a barn. Why, First Methodists or Baptists or Brethren or whatever over here don't get the free publicity we do? <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, the devil's busy. The devil is busy. Amen. So don't, don't take for granted. Make your calling and election sure. Believe that you'll endure. Believe you'll hold fast. That's what we teach. But don't. Be lulled to sleep. Be sober. Watch and pray. Jesus said, lest you fall into temptation. Amen. Father, we pray in Jesus' name that you'll keep every person under the sound of our voice from the evil one. You'll deliver them out of every temptation. You'll give them the door of escape. You'll deliver them out of their trials. We know you won't deliver them from all trial. Because you've promised trial as the way into the kingdom. That when they go through deep waters, that as you promised, they'll look to you and you will be with them. When they go through the fires, the fire will not burn them or scorch one hair of their head. That they'll look to you and trust you. We recognize the closeness of the hour. For Jesus' return, Father, and how the devil has come down in great wrath and he is seducing, deceiving, and destroying many, even some Christians. So our prayer is for this body. We thank you for having a people whose hearts are open to the word and receive it as truth from God. And we pray that you will keep them from error, from sin, from deception. I cover them with the blood of Jesus, mind and body, soul and spirit. I cover myself, mind and body and soul and spirit, and confess on behalf of the body of Christ in this place that we shall overcome. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Would you stand, please? Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God.
Let the Spirit descend upon us to cover and protect, to inspire, to deliver, to heal, to teach, and to reveal the truth of Jesus. Let the Spirit of God cover us like a cloud. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thus say, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut. And if you abide in the word that you've heard, and if you allow faith to penetrate more deeply into your heart, then that door will remain open to you, and you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done for you, saith the Lord. continues to say, and I will by my spirit remove everything from you, from your life, your mind, your body, soul, and spirit that would hinder the completion of my work in you. I will peel it off like the bark of a tree. I will remove everything that would hinder the word of God from penetrating the very depths of your being. If you submit to me, then you shall stand before me as a tree shed of its bark as I penetrate by my spirit into the very heart and core of your being with my word and my truth and the revelation of the knowledge of the Son of God, even Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Please. 
Praise God. Well, God has spoken to us by His Word and by His Spirit. Amen. He was showing me those things in the Spirit. I didn't know what to do with them. And then He chose to prophesy. But I saw the gate, and He opened the gate, and it stayed open. Then I saw Him peeling things off of something like bark off of a tree. And then the message that God will remove... Everything that would hinder the completion of His work in us if we submit to Him and allow Him to do the work. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Additional copies of this tape or a complete list of Dr. Freeman's tapes, books, and tracts may be obtained by writing to Faith Ministries, 824 East Winona Avenue, Warsaw, Indiana, 46580.